the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can the whole state of things, a pure violence without object and This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is a murder of the wheel, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's discussion, we just want to mention we do have a Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider throwing us a buck a month there, but if not, maybe leave us a nice review on iTunes. Today, Taylor and I are going to be bringing you a conversation that will be focusing on Jean Laplanche's life and death in psychoanalysis. I think this is a great text for really the generalist in terms of psychoanalysis. I think that due to Laplanche's fidelity to Freud, but the way that he sort of incorporates some of Lacan's moves, I'm thinking specifically perhaps in terms of the diagrammatics element of it. Then he also kind of does some forward stuff that I think is very, or some forward thinking of his own that I think would even be stuff that would be interesting for people that are interested in like Deleuze and Guattari's work. So I don't know if you agree, but, uh, I'd be interested to hear your take. I know we talked a little bit about the fidelity to Freud. Yeah, you know, I mean, Laplanche definitely has a fidelity to Freud in a certain way. You know, he was a student of Lacan's for many years and wrote, co-wrote some stuff with another guy named Pontelis, who isn't as well known, but was another, you know, kind of star student of Lacan's. They wrote an essay on, you know, fantasy and the unconscious. You can see that cited in um, Anti-Oedipus. I mean, one of the psychoanalysts that uh, Deleuze and Guattari actually treat fairly generously, if not very often, is Laplanche. They're pretty generous with him, you know, because this book, V.A. Moore in Psychoanalysis, would have come out in 1970. So two years before Anti-Oedipus. Interesting. um, you know, two years before that, as I said, one of the essays, this long essay, it's like 60 pages on fantasy and the unconscious. He co-authors that with Pontelis. And I bring that up because, you know, he also co-authored what's translated as the language of psychoanalysis in 67 in French with Pontelis. That really shows his studiousness, his grasp of psychoanalysis because you know it's mainly freud's language right it's his vocabulary as it's called in french but it incorporates lacan lagash klein Ferenzi, ronk some jung it really tries to constitute it, it's still i think kind of the not the bible but like the codex if you will it's the it functions not just as like a dictionary and encyclopedia but it it has a very good reference base what's the thing it's a what's the fucking thing that you have for the for bible like a concordance it's a it's it's kind of like a concordance it doesn't track down every reference but it's very useful for each term situating key texts and citations that can be referred to so it's very good as a study guide for psychoanalysis i highly recommend it to our listeners who are sort of wanting to get into or back into or just keep expanding their their knowledge of psychoanalysis. So Laplanche is definitely a heavy hitter. If 67, he's finishing what we think of as his studious work of sort of tracking down the concepts and sometimes the, we could call pseudo concepts or semi concepts in psychoanalysis, including some that he introduced, you know, he looks over here that we'll get into. I mean, in 70, this is his first 
sort of publication after his dissertation, which was written on Holderlin and the question of the father or the problem of the father, where we get some, a little bit more Lacanian type reading of Holderlin's work of his last years from the notion of, you know, names of the father and et cetera. So this is like his first kind of a fully psychoanalytic book publication besides, as I said, the co-author work with Pontelis. I do think that just before we get started, I mean, even though this text was translated in 85 and there's a nice collection of essays of his that's was published by Rutledge, what, in the late 90s, maybe, called Essays on Otherness, where he really goes into his own work. I, I would say it's like that's like the best little volume you could, you could turn to for sort of his mature thinking. He's still not very well, very much translated. He's got lots yeah. of stuff to be translated. He has a couple of books on Freud and sexuality. They have slightly different names, but they're it's kind of a mixture of of say his mature work and this stuff because he's returning to Freud, but he's also much more confident in bringing his own ways of breeding. And this work, you kind of, you can consider it kind of a transitional work where he is bringing a like a <laughs> studious eye and and trying to articulate these fundamental problems of Freud, including misreadings, but also you know, Freud's own simplicity can betray us as readers into, into lapsing into uh, maybe not reading so critically. But he is also bringing certain revisions, if you will, certain reframings of Freud that help bring out in better perspective sort of what Freud was doing and what he was yeah, going yeah. for. So, you know, this is a transitional work in the sense in which he's definitely trying to, as you say, kind of return to Freud, like Lacan was doing in the 50s and 60s, but also return to Freud with a bit of a, a swerve, right? Mm -hmm. Including notions of propping, which for translation reasons get kind of muddled, and the seduction theory, which we can go into. You know, there's all kinds of places we could start with in this yeah, in, in this text. But those are some of the ones I would start with, including what I've also hit you over the head with. Or it's been a while, but I used to, when we first started going into Freud, the way in which Laplanche really wants to set out straight from the beginning, like, hey, Freud has two terms that get translated as one in English and in the early French traditions of Freud, too, as one, Trieb and instinct. The German has has the word instinct, right? Take it from the Latin. And Freud uses those two terms. Really, you don't see instinct pop up very much. It comes up in um, Drives and Their Vicissitudes, which we've read. But normally Freud is talking about tree, but we should respect, right, that if instinct is kind of what the, how does Laplanche call it? It's the preform behavioral pattern whose arrangement is determined hereditarily and which is repeated according to modalities relatively adapted to a certain type of object. So it's, you know, we can imagine for the most part, instinct is an ethological term that we can imagine instinct being very strong in, let's just say non-human animals, not to be anthropocentric, but that's kind of where the term deserves its proper place is in ethology you know you just imagine i love this example my professor used to give me is like you can imagine a a baby bird in the nest it has an instinct right it has a hereditarily preformed kind of matrix for functioning how do baby birds not always just flop out of the nest and die they have a kind of instinct that makes them aware of gravity let's say whereas an infant child born too early at the edge of a cliff right wouldn't have that pre-adapted model and i think that's another term that laplanche really situates well from freud is this notion of of helplessness we are born too early we are born prematurely even if our gestation is 9 months you know we we really do need food shelter protection from a mother father or their substitute in order to survive in those first years of life compared to other animals whose prematurity, if you want to say it, the whose helplessness is not so great. In any case, you know, just to lay out, if for Laplanche instinct is, can be applied to, to humans, 
then drive, specifically Trebe, right, is a denaturing of instinct. And that's that's why he wants to call drive the drive proper. Unlike Freud's dualism, which we find later, life drives, mm-hmm. death drives, Laplace will want to say the drive, properly speaking, is the sexual drive. Um, which makes sense, right? All discourses are discourses of jouissance to draw from Lacan. But I think to bring that this notion into sharp relief would be to use Laplanche's own example from later in the text where he talks about how we have to sort of induce the child to eat, you know, the classic airplane, the mother or the father take a bite of the food to kind of seduce the child into eating the food. So in that regard, you can kind of clearly see how this notion of instinct within the human being is a sort of different question. Like we're, we're on a different terrain we're on a different register. Things are a lot more, let's say, messy than mm-hmm. when it comes to something like an instinct, which is less territorial. The human being is the less ter- territorialized animal, I, I think, would be the way to maybe if you want to think about that in that so, sense, I guess. I, I mean, I, I appreciate that. I, I do think so. Less territorialized, maybe less right? stratified. I mean, you less, can even less... think about this goes back to the organism, you know, from mitosis to meiosis, that's a deterritorialization. Like there's a lot more. You might even say, well, like unbound energy within the meiosis. There's a differential rather than this linear process that's at place, at which differential process is a lot more complex and nuanced, as especially with regard to the psychical apparatus of the human being, as we'll see. Because I think for me, one of the weirdest, this notion of the primal scene, I think, even going back to Wolfman and our discussions of Wolfman, was always something that just was so weird to me, but I think I get it just basically as of this morning when I'm going over my notes, I started to think, okay, so there's a little bit of a similarity here. You can kind of see how Freud comes up with this idea. Like it's sort of drawing on the same logic as the primal father. The notion of the primal father is this like fantasy. It's not a real historical figure per se, but even despite that, it can still have real effects on the body. And on the social, maybe, is the way to talk about that. As you have here, it's a myth. It's a fantasy. I would say the primal scene is interesting, right? Because that's one of the topics of the article he co-wrote with uh, Pontelis in 68 that Deleuze and Guattari cite. Because the interesting thing about Freud is, even if he knows very well that hysterics, for example, which is his first kind of you know, analyzans to work with in his first empirical data to work with. He knows very well that much of what hysterics recount is inflected with fantasy and doesn't necessarily have a real basis. Real in the sense of external, empirical, historical. Historical. I think historical is the way to think about it. Exactly. Same with like the the primal the father, the primordial father. That's exactly it's not historical. It's a structuring fantasy. Yeah, it's a structuring it, it, as a myth, as a myth, an explanatory device, etc. So Freud knows very well that hysterics. It's not even good to call it lie, even if even if we we call it even if yeah, because a lie would imply a sort of agency aspect of it. This is a, not a even voluntary the, deception. R- yeah, exactly. Yeah, or right. even this is more like almost like a disavowal. Yeah, I mean, it's so for Freud. What's interesting though with the Wolfman, which is what let's say middle or a little bit later of his work, not late as in beyond the pleasure principle, but uh, it's definitely mid to late. He's still trying to track back in time, a historical scene that would have constituted the quote unquote, real external basis for the wolf man's dream. What's interesting about the primal scene is that it's like the bedrock that Freud it's the kernel of the dream that can't be accessed, but Freud still wants to like hunt it down. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting about it is... In a primal... type of empirical sense. Yeah, and as a scientist, whatever, you know. But what's interesting about the primal scene, if you want to, or just any sort of... It's so illogical. Any, any and sort like, of it's traumatic... The diff- it's the differential aspect of it that I think is yeah, like, the, the, and that's, is, that's it's so weird. I don't know. It's it's such a weird fucking thing. That's what I'm going to get to, <laughs> is the differential aspect. You're right to say that. It's... The primal scene would be the traumatic because... event in one's life, right? That would not have a sexual content at the time. Right. Because the, as Laplanche makes clear, and we can just kind of anticipate, the ego is not 
you don't come out of the womb with an ego fully formed with an individuality. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, exactly. Like there's, an individ- there's an individuation of the individual, not only physically, but psychically. Yes. That I yeah. think, I, th- I mean, I can kind of see why you are sort of drawn to the work of, uh, you know, not only because of his impact on the loves, but like Simone Doan, right? Yeah. This is very yeah. part of the same kind of thrust of like a, the germ of the same kind of a way right. of understanding the individual and the way that these psychic processes, it makes complete sense in the way that, you know, systems typically they tend to, or systems start simple and they, they evolve and they expand and systems get more complex and et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the basic way to understand that we don't come out of the oven with these baked in instincts. I mean, just to reiterate this idea, we have to sort of generate our own we're so deterritorialized that well, it's, it's we have gener- to use these imaginary or tra- we have to have something to lean on. That's the propping, the necessity yeah. of the propping and the phallus and all of that is to have a structure. We need something outside of us to engage with in this differential relationship. Yeah, uh, so maybe ex- you're, you're exactly right. Something though. like that. I, go ahead. Sorry, you're, you're exactly <laughs> right. Though. It's not. It's not internal for Freud. For Laplace, the unconscious is external. It's externally embedded, as Laplace likes to say, like an, an alien entity, right? right? That that is embedded from the outside, from other adults, etc. So I think that's why Freud wants to hunt down the primal scene to find out the traumatic moment that can't be recalled, right? That is. First of all, it can't be processed because we don't, we lack the sexual, we lack the, either the individuation or the unconscious or the ego, or we lacked the latency period of puberty to understand. We lack the sexual knowledge. These are kind of unassimilable signifiers that embed like shards in our unconscious and form the kind of outcroppings of it. And it's only later with a, another event that the sexual significance is triggered. For Laplanche, as for Freud, the primal scene is not what is traumatic, properly speaking. It's not the first event that's traumatic, even if that embeds the kernel. It's the memory that triggers the associative link with that immemorial primal scene, that immemorial trauma that activates the the symptom that activates yeah. the trauma. So it's the memory that is traumatic. And that's why Freud will say in what 1895 on his studies on hysteria that uh, hysterics primarily suffer from reminiscences. It's the reminiscences that are triggered by event B that trigger the, the sort of trauma, the breach of the ego, which is sort of the, the ideas of sexuality that that get linked back to some prior event. But, you know, for yeah. Laplace, it's... Rat, Rat Man would be the really good example of that, right? Because he comes up with that whole convoluted story about the money that he, like, creates that sort of unsolvable riddle for himself with regard to paying back the money that is owed. Yeah, and the 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 example Laplace gives that I think is even better than Wolfman or Rat Man, just because it's simpler, is... The case of Emma, which is, again, from the 1895 cases, and very quickly, Emma's eight, goes into a store, supposedly is, and as we can take, is quote-unquote seduced, as LaPonche calls it. She's sexually groped through her clothes, and then comes back a few years later, right, after she's gone through puberty or is going through puberty, and sees two, sees the guy that groped her, and his co-worker laughing. And so it's the laughing that sets off that trauma of being sexually assaulted. She runs out of the store. And so she has, in her anxiety, she has these laughing faces. She has this, it's not even his face. It's just a laughing face that's like, we could say is, you know, that's like the signifier of the superego or whatever it is. But, you know, for Freud, it's the fact that this, and Laplanche makes it very clear, right, that she she kind of reproaches herself for having gone back, even if she didn't understand the significance, the sexual significance of the first encounter. It's that going back that makes her feel guilty and anxious 
And so it's it's this differential relation, as you said, this nonlinear kind of relation that what's traumatic is even if the second scene isn't sexual, it triggers off, it offsets the sexual significance from the first scene. And so it's it's the interplay, it's that seesawing between the two that then gets associated symbolically with clothing, with laughing face, whichever signifiers can symbolize the unassimilable primal scene. And so there's something similar with how he reads The Wolf Man, but you know, as Laplanche makes it clear, Freud knows very well that what's important is, is fantasy. What's important is the role of fantasy in conveying this charge of trauma, not necessarily the real event. And so like F- Freud has this, he's wanting to be empirical and track down the historical event but in in reality it doesn't really that is secondary to well the wolfman's dream or emma's symptom that's kind of you know freud's tendency to to relapse into a kind of positivism let's say to try to like positively unearth the, yeah 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 that makes sense the thing that did it right whereas the thing that did it was actually the uh the second event in chronological times yeah, very Hegelian kind of the phenomenology, the preface or whatever, doesn't he kind of have this sort of... So events have to happen first, and then we can retroactively apply our interpretation to those events. So there's always going to be... the Al Minerva, right? The Al yeah, there's Minerva. always that gap in between our between the event and our perception of it. It's not instantaneous. So the reading Hegel book we were looking at or we're going to do an episode on kind of touched on this with regard to Marx as well and complicating some aspect of, I guess, revolution, but I can't recall the specifics. There's a lot of stuff we can go into there. Repetition, you know, first is tragedy, then is farce stuff. But, you know, I, I do think that it is good that you brought out this notion of the, of the myth and the primal scene, because it, it does help to situate the fact that we're born too early. Sexuality comes too early and too late, but we're born too early. That's helplessness. But sexuality comes too early because sort of... We're already getting seduced by the mother whenever we're imbibing the milk or whatever. The mother or her substitute, as Freud will say, right? The mother or her substitute. It's just whatever caretaker is involved with feeding us, with clothing us, with bathing us, bathing us, with washing us. There's always these residues these sort of unconsciously transmitted sexual signifiers that start to encrust and insist and form form our unconscious. And so that's that's kind of for him the meaning of seduction. Not in the sense that Freud kind of took it literally. See, this is this is again Freud's literality and his positivism, yeah. where he was dealing with these hysterics who were kind of the kernel back to which they fall, usually it was through hypnosis and whatever. This is one of the reasons why he abandoned it, not the only one. Working through doesn't doesn't occur in hypnosis either. That's the main reason. But these other things, tracing back the traumatic infantile or, you know, kernel of the trauma was always seduction by some adult, usually a parent, usually a father, right? And Freud eventually took this as confirmation of sexual, of a couple of things. One, pathologies, neurosis, et cetera, has a sexual underlying basis and that the trauma occurs in childhood. And so that confirmed some of his biases, which I think he stuck with. But the one thing that he had to let go of was this idea that it was a historical event that happened that it had to have been a literal historical seduction, molestation, et cetera, going on. Because statistically, and this is, again, Freud using one positivist hypothesis to outrule another, statistically, it wouldn't make sense. There would have to be both more and less historical seduction. There would need to be more cases than then resulted in neurosis, but also it would be too widespread because, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily lead to uh, 
on the side of the individual to that outcome. I didn't really say that well, but so I think what you're getting at is Freud kind of deduces there are all these hysterical or no, there's all these neurotic patients coming to me. The source of their neurosis seems to be sexually related, meaning that there's some type of as a child, they experience some type of traumatic event that or like something that is (laughs) person. So I guess he's thinking about child molestation, literally. Okay, there literally there's too many reports the prevalence of neuroticism is too high for there to have actually been this amount of sexual molestation going on amongst families, right? There's something else going on. It's not a one-to-one. It's not yeah. like this, literal, this literal traumatic event, this retroactivity. Yes. Too many neuroses without a reflectivity. A, a, actual, actual re- reported cases. But it's also, like a recursive logic. But also not every reported case leads to neurosis in the in the. Oh, subject. right. Yeah. Oh, now that's right. a, so that's it's a just strong a, point. Yeah, yeah. It's a kind of, uh, you know, it's a kind of double bind, if you will, in the sense in which, yeah, there's too many reported cases that don't lead to neurosis. So what there has to be something else, something significant to disturb the psychical apparatus. But then he realizes very quickly around the time of 1895, so it wasn't a hypothesis he had for even a decade, it seems, that yeah, in fact, even if there are cases where actual historical seductions by the father, caretaker, or even a stranger leads to neurosis, um, the overwhelming majority of the cases he's dealing with, he sees that the there's a misremembering, if you will, it's a term like, I don't think Freud uses it, but the term is confabulation where, you know, these later memories are conflated with, you know, these, this earlier event to make sense of things. And so you have this fabrication by the subject in order to integrate. Even recently in the nineties, there was a case of what's called like repressed memories. And, uh, you know, that's, There's a famous case, a daughter against the father, and some laws had to be changed in order to bring the case to court, right? Because in many states still, but especially then, what's the statute of limitations for rape? Three years, something like that in most states. So, uh, and then it turns out that these events didn't happen. So this is very much similar in the legal system in the United States in the past 20 odd years that that Freud was dealing with too, realizing, wait a minute, what matters is the kernel of fantasy involved, not the actuality, the historical, you know, we don't need to do some detective work on the historical side to see that we've got all the makings of a detective case in its own right in the psychical realm of fantasy. And I think that for Freud, you know, there's a sensitivity with which he's trying to also not deny that that these things happen and still happen and have happened for thousands of years. But Laplante seizes upon this to say, wait a minute, Freud was on to something with seduction, except that he took it literally, he took it historically and not didn't go far enough with its element in fantasy life and the fact that for Laplante, we are all seduced in a more generalized and universalized sense insofar as we are born helpless and we have to be fed, nurtured, taken care of. Our needs have to be seen after. And it's, it's in seeing after our vital functions to make sure that we survive and our, our vital life prospers that there is inevitably an unconscious transference, if you will, not in the sense of analytic setting, but there is a transferring of the adult's sexual unconscious life involuntarily through these actions of loving. I mean, even Freud kind of goes back to this, but he just doesn't call it seduction anymore. He's given up that language. You know, Freud talks about the mother's kissing the child, cradling the child, obviously breastfeeding the child. All of these things are endowed with an intensive life, an intensive sexual imbuing into the child who who does not yet have the unconscious apparatus to navigate or decipher those sexual messages. So this is why Laplanche is always talking about as these these alien signifiers that are like shards that, that take time to decipher and that are only deciphered after the event. This is another important term that Freud uses throughout his work that Laplanche really seizes upon 
is the noctreglicite, right? Literally the after the event in terms of something is dragged along from the past into the future and is only activated afterwards. Not just puberty and the latency of the sexual drives, but traumatic events and the reactivation of memories, etc. Just to clarify, I think this even goes to something like the myth of the given with regard to sexuality, although it's not one in which we like, not all of it is conscious activity, just to highlight there. Like it's even the, even the like unconscious affect or something has to be learned, I suppose, through repetition or some shit. I don't know. Through signification, not the fantasy element. I'm just kind of throwing out some, just to draw this out in a, from a different angle, I suppose. The human as tabla rasa in a sense. In terms of sexuality, there's a tabla rasa in terms of, so if the first need is being, what, being kept warm and being fed, if the first satisfaction is a satisfaction of instinct, properly speaking, right. of feeding, let's just say. Yeah. This is what Laplace will want to distinguish as a function. If the instinctual can be called functional, there's a function of hunger, of feeding you know, we need that sustenance, that nourishment. That's a satisfaction of function. But in terms of what then starts to evolve is what Laplace wants to call the drive, properly speaking. Trebe, properly speaking, the sexual drive. In the satisfaction of what? It's the desiring machine. It's the, it's the brakes flows. The, the mouth machine breaks off a flow of milk from the breast right. machine. A right? quanta of energy, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's in that interrelation that the sexual drive begins to crop up and prop itself on the instinctual function and denature it and swerve it. This is why he talks about the sexuality as like a constitutive Kleinemann. It's already... A, deviated from the start as it starts because it's already leaning on it's already inclined upon the vital function of feeding i'll uh confess something personal here i'm someone that tends to eat their feelings in the sense you know obviously it's tied to libido i think in particular something like like a chocolate a sweet the intensity of that experience of consuming and taking and this is what is it um what is the what's the word for when it, incorporation right yeah. So I think that's a weird element of the seductive part of the... Game. Yeah, incorporation is modeled after the oral drive, so yeah. Because I think you can kind of see there's like a... I mean, this would go back to even symposium, the desire for the two parts of the human to regain their... Right? So I think there's a similarity there with regard to the sexual... If we're going to speak of specifically penetrative penis and vagina sexual... Or I guess it doesn't even have to be that, right? It could be... That would be a late stage. That would be a late comer, you know, to the game, not to pun. <laughs> right? You know, because if we roughly follow Freud's trajectory with the oral drives as being, you know, one of the what we would call pregenital or whatnot, it is that act of incorporating the milk that also then the breast becomes an object, a virtual object in fantasy, because we are also incorporating the image of we're, we're incorporating the function of sucking for sustenance becomes takes on a sexual overtone, a sexual significance that erupts in the child as an alien signifier, if you will. And so incorporating takes on its own sexual significance. So the oral drive as sexual is secondary to but propped on the oral function, if you will, right? It's only later that they diverge, but sexuality is already perverted from the start. Is As we already saw from three essays on sexuality, we already saw that if the thumb is a, becomes a virtual object that is in fantasy kind of substituting itself for the mother, for the mother's breast, that's just one of the ways in which the sexual drive is already deviated and perverse constitutively, but not necessarily in a way that makes it bad it just makes it take on you know this whole other dimension to the living to the human being that's part of it is in the human being sexuality is fucked up from the start there's still something instinctual to it but it's displaced or it's 
there's a differential and it's not this one to one. And I'm wondering if, if the sexual charge of eating and satisfying other drives is part of the lure we've talked in the past about kind of the lure for procreation would be the orgasm, right? It has yeah. no, at least on the female side, even like it has no function necessarily per se, as opposed to the masculine ejaculation, right? Somebody has to ejaculate for there to be procreation. Now, the way that that ejaculate gets to pair with the egg, that's a whole, that can be deterritorialized in many ways. Like that's an open question for us to solve as far as procreation. That's an open field. There are practices that get historically embedded, right? Heterosexuality. But I've given the example of taking a, a turkey baster. You could like harvest the man's semen. You can, to be very crude about it, but you get the point, I think. So I do think you think that, that that's the case, that the sexual excitation is the lure? It's a more subtle, under the surface sort of lure, I guess. I would just say that the, there is a satisfaction of the function in feeding, in the instinct the satisfaction of the function is related to an internal stimulus in a certain yeah. sense, well, right? Laplanche, though, gives Laplanche brings up that notion that you kind of have to induce the child to eat later on, which I think is kind of a, illustrates that it's not this linear. That's getting yeah, further yeah, yeah. along. Because right? we're talking because... about from breastfeeding to like a three or four year old. Obviously, there's a big gap of individuation that occurs there, right? It's kind of what you're saying. The infant normally, and I say normally here because I'm not a, a pediatrician instinctively searches out the breast, fumbles for it, right? So yeah, it needs help along the way, but it's it's still trying to fulfill a vital function, whereas thumb sucking doesn't fulfill a vital function and yet simulates simulates one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, it's it simulates that instead of a displacement of the vital function onto the, the sexual because of the way that the sexual drive props on initially and then can diverge. So we can talk about a secondary deviation or a secondary perversion. Deriving pleasure from thumb sucking is just, that's just the, the orbit of the drive, right? That's just the drive, the sexual drive exciting itself. And this is why for, for Freud, after we've sort of fulfilled these needs and once the sexual drive starts to prop up then we can really talk about autoerotism broadly the autoerotogenic zones the erotogenic zones right where the body is still kind of fragmented but we can take pleasure in it our own source sort of the partial drives the skin even the internal organs right for freud can be these partial organs of of satisfaction but, you know, I think that the important thing is it's only later that we start to conceive of total objects and specifically the ego as a narcissistic object, right? The ego taken as a love object in a certain sense. So, yeah, you, you talked about destratification, deterritorialization at the start. I mean, I think that's part of it. And but in any case, we've we've talked about seduction, right? This outside encounter with adult sexuality for which the child is not prepared until much later. And uh, we talked about propping, you know, of the drive on the function. And I think that those two things are important for understanding what Laplanche means when he says that, you know, Freud's seduction theory should be should be taken back up, but it should be generalized and universalized and not and not taken literally. What do you think about the question Laplanche asks as far as um, the sex drive or, or the sexual drive in particular being repressed and none of the other drives being repressed? Do you recall this? If it would help to pull up a passage, I suppose I could do that. But yeah, I mean, bell at all? he brings it up in several registers, but this notion that it is, you know, it is sexuality or the sexual drive that is repressed. Yeah, you have it here. When he's talking about the general layman's view of psychoanalysis, the man on the street, which is, you know, what repression was accepted as repression, what is repressed as sexuality. He says something like that, right? You know, I think that it's mainly the idea that Freud went through, as we talked about in the three essays, he went through a, a lot of 
trouble, I would say, and was a little bit controversial and polemical in his three essays in order to destroy the common received notion of sexuality. Right. And as we said, it still kind of exists with us today, even if it's more accepted now to talk about childhood sexuality or infantile sexuality, it would have been, it's still kind of weird. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I was thinking about the mother, you know, I was trying to explain this to even a friend of mine that is like taking some counsel, like not counseling, but some type of therapeutic program they're involved in. And I was talking about how, yeah, it's like if you told the mother that they were like getting off on the baby suckling, like feeding the baby, that would be kind of, there's something horrifying or like repulsive to our own concepts of morality there. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And you can also see in the fact that by and large, it's like um, we have to, the viral conspiracy that is repressed. Theories. That's what's repressed is the sexual ass, the non relation. I don't understand how that kind of, fits in but maybe it does i think that what's repressed maybe is not sexuality and it's common notion because one of the things he says is the common man on the street might think repression and sexuality are the two things that represent psychoanalysis okay fair but when freud is being attacked and we can still see him being attacked as uh having a theory of pansexuality the claim is that everything is reduced to sexuality right this is and, good I, and, I love this distinction and Laplanche makes the counter that it's not that everything is sexual, it's that sexuality kind of pervades and perverts everything and, and drags it along with it in its deviation. Exactly. When I was having that conversation, same difficulty was like, they were like, no, they're like, kind of it's sort of like a knee jerk reaction against that notion. But when you really consider it, I don't know, it's again, it's not like this one to one. This is clearly shown by what we were talking about with the function and the drive, the sexual drive, right? That that in a certain way, the drive is a Kleinman, is a swerving from the function. If the function is to suckle at the breast and to gain sustenance, to satisfy a need, then suckling on the thumb is already kind of simulating that need and it is swerving the need into the drive's orbit. Uh, where, interesting. That's where the propping really shines, I think, as a theory, because it shows how all the things that we might think of as being completely innocent, in a certain sense, we're already devoid of innocence from the moment the sexual drive starts to swerve. Yeah. Starts to swerve and drag along with it the vital functions, right? So, as you said, you know, you were talking about eating. There's obviously ways in which eating can be sexualized or is already sexualized. And that's not because of some perverse pleasure in the taste of chocolate or something as an aphrodisiac. It is more basic than that, right? It is right. that yeah. It is that excitation of the organs. The psychical. Uh, you know, it is that, you know, it, it is the fact that there is I mean this gets into an phantasmatic intense, think, life of yeah. Of, you there's know, an of, intensity of the aspect. vital order. There's an intensity aspect of it. I almost feel like the greater the, I don't know how to really work through this, but it's like the greater the gap or like the bigger the space that is compressed into a singularity or something like that with regard to psychical excitation, the more satisfying the release or something like that. And this goes back to the, I guess, Freud kind of, thinks of it in terms of this pressure, right? There's this pressure on the body. That psychical energy builds and builds until it has it has to have some type of outlet. And that's where sublimation can sort of come into play. Well yeah, this is a good chance to But I guess that desexualizes to a degree, but I, I don't know that it does exactly. Maybe it it kind of does, but it doesn't. This is a good chance to talk about the four aspects of the drive. You brought up the first, which is drawing, which is pressure. Pressure is the demand for work. Demand for work, right. That represents the drive psychically, right? That the drive yeah. psychically represents. What's the relation? I mean, this is a bit speculative. What is the relation between that to desiring production? Because I find a very, and I mentioned this in a prior episode, I don't recall which, where I asked this question, or similar line of reasoning. You know, demand for work in terms of desiring production, well, first, the demand for work, the pressure and the drive is the fact that an external stimulus can be evaded or, or run away from, whereas an internal stimulus cannot. 
right? So if the drive is taken as an internal stimulus and building up a pressure, it's a demand for evacuating that pressure. This is what Freud calls satisfaction when we're talking about the drive specifically. Yeah, because we're taking satisfaction the body, is we're the taking aim the body's of the drive. Yeah, we're taking the the body's psychical energy and we're like flattening it out. We're going back to a zero state of homeostasis. It's almost like a wave. If you think about the higher the amplitude of the wave from zero, the greater the satisfaction. Potentially, I think that that could be right. It could be. Uh... Could be also, I think that that could be right in general. There's also a rhythm to it, but yes. Yeah, because I was thinking like the sexual would be the ultimate expression of the way the effectual tension of the orgasm is maybe one of the highest register or registers a higher amplitude than any other type of release of energy. But that's not to say that writing a poem can't. There's an amplitude of that as well. So it's still providing satisfaction, but it may not provide the same level of intensity. I, I do think that it's important. You, you brought up the, the the stimulus of the body. I think that for Freud, right, the pressure is sort of a delegate, a psychical representative of the source of the body, right? If the body is the biological medium within which the stimulus is yeah, the body uh, has the, the body the, has the to tension, the tension is psychical, right? So the tension, the work, the pressure, the working through and the pressure of the drong of the drive is within the psychical apparatus as he wants to say it. And that includes and so if the aim of the drive is always active in the sense of its satisfaction, it's releasing that tension and that pressure fulfilling that demand for work through some sort of evacuation, yeah, which yeah. can be, which can be in talking like we're doing here. Which yeah, can yeah. Be oh, for like, sure. Like the talking cure in, um, in Freud's way of speaking or just venting as we, we call it like in, in everyday life, we just, we, sometimes it's good to just vent already that has a metaphorical relation to this notion of this economic notion of, of building up pressure and releasing it. I mean, and I guess in terms of, you know, in terms of desiring production, the demand for work is kind of a demand to connect, disjoin and conjoin that the um, the productions themselves entail. Like via the syntheses? Yeah. That, that, that's or would it be of, more like the machine aspect of like the break flows with the, the teat and the milk? That's part of the same thing, though, right? You're connecting. Yeah, I guess that's true you're disjoining and i and i guess that the demand for work is then becomes more complicated for design production because then it becomes whether we're talking about an exclusive use of the syntheses or an imminent use and that gets us into the their own paralogisms of the unconscious and gets us kind of far afield from freud so i would just say that you know in terms of the demand for work in desiring production it might be a slippage in terms to do a an easy overlay of the two. But yeah, you could suppose fluxes, flows, providing some sort of pressure and breaks cutting off that pressure. You could also suppose demand for work transposed onto the body without organs insofar as the organs, the body without organs attract these machines, these desiring machines, but also wants to repel them. I think that that could be a demand for work too, right? In terms of the psychical apparatus and wanting to keep intensity as close to zero as possible, right? That's like the desiring machines trailing off back into the desert. So, I mean, you can make some analogies. I don't think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah, um, it could be like maybe they kind of were inspired by this aspect or something whenever they were developing their concept or something. I think all that, that I think, might I th be the better way to I think, like I, historically understand it. I think definitely on the one hand there, Guattari at least, if not Deleuze, I don't know why he wouldn't know the essay. They're inspired by the four factors of, of the drives and their vicissitudes, the way that Freud describes drive as pressure, aim, object, and source. I think that they deterritorialize the source, right? Because body without organs already implies a questioning of the organism and its sort of ideal source material. I think they want to also, they definitely want to denature the object, which Freud too already does, because for Freud, we don't have a, a predestined object and we're not, but we're not also not necessarily objectless. The drive doesn't have an object at the start, but the vital functions do. 
right? The vital functions object is satisfaction of need, right? Is whatever can do that, whether it be the breast or a bottle, milk, whatever sort of sustenance. The sexual drives first object is kind of a, an analogy, a mimicking, a, a simulation of the, of the object of the need, right? And so you can kind of see some of this too, where it's the same kind of evolution in, in thinking. But I do think that the one thing that they would disagree with, even if you broke down drive into, and this is why they don't really use the term, into yeah that is interesting right? into into pressure object aim source one thing they would definitely have beef with with freud is how at each stage to a certain extent freud is using this language of ideational representative that the source is sort of an ideational a psychical representative a psychical delegate of the body right so it's it's this kind of there's a kind of cartesianism to it right there's a kind of space of representation to this language of breaking down the drive insofar as we can't measure the work we don't have apparatuses to measure it even if ripe trying to measure orgone might have had like right. had some analogy to this so you know i think that that would be their main question because for them desiring production is sub-representative or a representative it doesn't take place on the plane of representation. It's it's completely different register. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because I was going to say the same sort of logic would be like, okay, I'm experiencing psychical pressure or whatever pressure in the body or in the psyche. And I have to interpret that and express it. You know what I mean? I have to mediate the desire, the pressure of desire, and I have to direct it somewhere. Obviously, I can't, I can't interpret my desire before the fact there has to be an issue there has to be pressure before i can interpret that's almost a signifier in a sense to go back to seminar 20 at the end lacan's discussion of the rat and the maze i think there's maybe a connection do you see what i'm saying where you kind of have to build at that level even a process right you have to construct the the system to interpret your needs or desires or whatever the i think it's interesting what you brought up here because you know in humans as in other animals, on the instinctual level, on the level of needs, vital functions, we can think of a rhythm, right? We can think of a sleep pattern. Yeah. Uh, I eat, I, eat, I think, shit, I... Yep, yeah, exactly. I, I drink, can, I piss, etc. We can think of those Sleep is a functions. better example, but... But but no, I mean, you're right, too. Replenishing bodily fluids. Exactly. Replenishing exactly. nourishment. Right. A sleep even maybe some rhythms and and staying warm but that's a little bit extraneous we can imagine a a climate where it's 70 degrees all day or whatever i do think that there's a rhythm to that instinct to a certain extent as we see in animals but in terms of sexuality in terms of the sexual drive that's where we don't have like other animals have a kind of pre yeah we don't go into heat system of rutting heat exa exactly etc even if there might be some science in the future to to, to detect uh, to one, look at pheromones and stuff like that, we see that it's not universal. And I'm not yeah. just talking about incels. We see that there are much more asexual types. There's also sexual predatory types. But to call that a rhythm, as though each person had their own rhythm, would be, I think, a misuse of the term. Yeah, right? I would think about it like this. I would kind of say that, okay, so the human... Human sexuality is deterritorialized here because there is no there's no necessity to fall into these very territorialized uh, rhythmic functions that you're discussing. Right. Human sexuality is open to whatever time frame. I mean, this gets into biologism, so I don't know if it's even worth bringing up, honestly. So, but so go, go no, ahead. We, whatever, we, if you had something. But we, are, we are trying to relate the biological substratum to the psychical, right? I mean, like, I think that even Freud in a late text like Beyond the Pleasure Principle is when he almost gets the most biological. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, and we can't we can't really avoid it when we're talking about yeah, sexuality. Perhaps, it's going to yeah. have that biological substratum, but you're totally right that, you know, even if there is the latency period which we've discussed, right, that the child is under-equipped to deal with these, you know, alien, adult, Sensations, sexual yeah. meanings. It, see, oh, yeah, yeah. See, it doesn't, the, the child doesn't have the linguistic, it doesn't understand the signification aspect of it yet. It can't define its own desire 
Uh, that's kind of clunky, but do you see what I'm saying? It can't interpret or successfully integrate these sexual signifiers that are coming from the adult world that are coming from a post pubescent world. It's only with right. I mean, it may be researches. Even... It's only with the working out of childhood sexual theories, right. which Freud was very interested in. It's only with the onset of puberty through the latency period that we begin to have, let's say, the unconscious equipment. But on a biological level, there's also the influx of hormones, et cetera, et cetera. There is the developing development, not just of the ego, but also just in general of intelligence. There's a number of factors here that aren't merely reducible, I think, to, to strictly psychical domains. We do have to consider the, the, the body, a little yeah. bit, a, a little bit of, a little bit of, of the body. body. Yeah. But um, it's, yeah, it's the differential aspect of it, I think, makes it harder. Certainly. And you, you say differential, and I want to hear deferential. Ah, there, there's a defer, it's the deferred action, right? It's the not. Well, I just type. think that like it's the opera coup, which gives us a differential. Well, here's what I'm thinking of, of like time my, lag. Okay. So I'm just speaking in terms of the logic. It goes back to like the primal scene, even that sim- logic is similar. It's like this recursive logic after the fact. Yeah. It's retrospective. Given B, there will have been a wherever right. in the historical fog of, of but it's also time. like, not that there's a necessarily remember I brought up the idea of the lure with regard to the sexual sort of being that charge or the like extra aspect that encourages needs to be met or something like that. Maybe there's a lure of sexual pleasure in eating as a sort of not instinct per se, but as a type of way to provide a pressure towards eating, if that makes sense. Like as a secondary problem. Well, what we that know that sense. we know that eating disorders are a thing, and that one doesn't necessarily eat to satisfy a function. That's a very right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's its own thing. There's ways in which the sexual the drive can push us to eat or to even Freud notes like the child will sort of masochistically build up. Uh, bowel and their their systems to build up the pressure to so that there yeah so that there's more pleasure in evacuating i mean yeah right. there's, yeah there's... the amplitude see there that's where the amplitude of the right pressure right. comes into play but i think maybe here's the better example would be yeah the primal scene because it's not an actual real event whereas if you're thinking a linear logic it would be okay there was there's a real event that creates this traumatic response if it's if a lot more convoluted if, than that, right? Yeah. So it yeah. can, like you were saying, again, to go back to whenever Freud was working through this problem of, okay, we have these, I have all these neurotic patients. Something is amiss here because we can't have that amount of child molestation going on. There has to be something at play here, right? Because one would think, like, if you're just using kind of elementary man off the street logic, it makes total sense that there would be this traumatic event as a child that gets repressed and then is expressed. But this is like a totally different thing. This is saying this is a fantasy. Do you see what I'm saying? Like that's definitely not something that you could ever develop without a practice of analysis. That's the materialism of Freud. Right. This is a creation of knowledge of a knowledge. It gets back to the Emma case I brought up earlier when Freud's like, okay, so she's eight years old. She gets groped which we, we could take as the event of right. the, the sexual encounter event. She's not yet equipped unconsciously to interpret what's happened to her, even if she may feel unpleasure in other ways. She's not able to grasp the sexual significance. She comes back later, sees the, the laughing faces. She becomes anxious at them, but also castigates herself. She's guilty, feeling that she wanted to go back through this earlier experience. And so what Laplante calls this, you can't say that event A, which the chronological event A, the first event, quote unquote, Cause is sexual. I mean, even se- cause it, B. <laughs> it, it's sexual in the sense in which there's a sexual act occurring. But for the, for the person, for Emma, it lacks sexual significance. At least it may be foggy, it may be, but it hasn't yet taken on its traumatic Colonel, but event B, when she comes back, she's not sexually assaulted. So that's not sexual. So this is where, in terms of the primal scene, Laplace does something really cool where he says, 
This is a Heisenbergian aspect of trauma. In situating the trauma, we cannot appreciate its traumatic impact and vice versa. We may find the, you know, the primal scene that Freud's looking for positively, but that's not where the trauma happens. The trauma happens in the reminiscence and whatever sets off the associated link that's been not necessarily severed, but not integrated, right? Because we're really talking about these, again, these alien shards that are embedded in the unconscious from adult sexuality that we're not yet equipped to deal with. There hasn't yet been an integration going on and they haven't been activated yet. They're like a memory trace that never produced a memory, right? So it's this, it's kind of this other ethereal limbo that takes time, that requires a deferred action that takes on, they weren't even repressed. This is the weird thing, right? Yeah, like, exactly. They never got pressed. <laughs> they, ha they had to wait till later to take on a pressing. And this is kind of why right. Lacan, they have too, to, they have to learn repression from the social from the i mean social here being the learning sexuality being developing the sex the sexual intelligence one of the sources can be the social but it can be hormonal it can be through what freud talks about when he talks about the wolfman because the wolfman's traumatic kernel starts at age four or five which is way before puberty but Freud is hypothesizing sexual researches. One can imagine precocious children who are much more bombarded, let's say, by these alien signifiers. So they they have to grope around for understanding earlier. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes... You know, this is I like that too, actually. It's not just at puberty. Oh, I've got I've got it now. I mean, like, right. we, we do it's a know, process, of course. We do know of individuals that, yeah, that that take much longer or much less long to sort of become aware and develop the means with which to interpret and decipher these originally undecipherable signifiers, right? I mean, maybe it's a little bit different for us as boys and growing up in the porn internet age, right? You know, you can kind of, if you want Well, I think to, women are exposed, to, exposed to the desire of men a lot. And that's true too, but there are also, there are also innocent, good Christian girls that may or may not develop, you know, earlier or later, depending on their insularity, depending on the media with which they are able to, to accustom themselves. I mean, Freud's reading of one of the, the Dora case, the, the fragment on, a, on analysis, one of the main culprits in how Dora develops her sexual knowledge when she's been so cut off is through these like encyclopedias with like sexual knowledge that's supposedly like supposed to be forbidden right she's waiting till her parents are going to sleep to like sneak around in the library and read these like medical journals right you know like a book on midwifery or something <laughs> it's interesting the sources or the secondary sources of sexuality are very interesting and so it doesn't necessarily have to follow any as you're saying it is there is this whole differentiality that's highly complex and highly individual it doesn't necessarily have to be hormonal or biological that plays a part that obviously plays a part, but that's more on the instinctual side, if you will. If you want to make at this point, at that point in puberty, at that stage in development, if you want to try to distinguish the instinctual and the vital from the sexual, which is highly dubious given what we're talking about with Laplanche, yeah, the hormonal could be that biological substratum, but it only is a catalyst for the unpacking of the sexual drive unpacking in the sense of rendering decipherable and yeah, yeah. more conscious. And it's at that stage of becoming conscious that then we can have the trauma, that the trauma can really set in because that's the breach or the affraction of the ego as defensive shield or ah, right, however right, you want to call right. it, that creates this rush of excitation that is experienced as unpleasure. And that, and the ego fights back and tries to inhibit that unpleasure through repression. But the unconscious is also from its side sucking down. You know, if the ego is pressing down, if we can think about it, ego is pressing back, repressing the, the idea, the associative symbol of the traumatic event or memory. The unconscious is also kind of like yeah, the four and half pressure that you yeah exactly. The it's the times. it's the four pressure and the after pressure. The unconscious would also have to be in 
cahoots with the ego, with the repressive agency. Otherwise, I mean, for Freud, he kind of makes it an economical argument. If this were not the case, the psychical apparatus would work differently because there's more of an expenditure in repression than in working through and associatively integrating. There's much less tension involved. Oh, interesting. Right? So, okay. So, that's so, resistance? or Well, that's resistance to the cure. Sure. I mean, but, but that's different, right? That's a little bit different because, you know, if we follow Freud along, it would be the case that psychoanalysis, that analysis would be very easy. You just go and see somebody, they give you a magic cure, they hypnotize you, right? they give you suggestion. And you know what? The psychical apparatus wants to evacuate that tension, wants to go back to zero. So why not stop repressing? That'll, that'll save up a lot of energy for other things. And I think that to a certain extent, there's many factors in there for Freud, but one of them is... We could call it this resistance to working through and integrating. There's still so much unpleasure in in actually connecting the links together. There's still this, you know, we could call it there's a fixation of the drive to these alternate means that it's found providing satisfaction despite that repression. There's the secondary benefits of the illness, what Lacan, as you might call, enjoy your symptom, right? That Another aspect of it, not the only one, because that's super ego stuff, but the secondary benefits of the illness is kind of... Yeah, so it'd be like sympathy, et cetera, that one would receive. Yeah. And Almost so, like the, uh, what is it? N not quite the Munchausen by proxy, but... Hypochondria? Like a, like, yeah, exactly. Something like that, like a hypochondria. And there is a lot of energy expended to work through the integration of the memory. And so there could also just on an economic basis be that the repression, if it takes a lot of psychical force to, mm -hmm. to keep the idea out of the associative link, to keep the symbol from being integrated, there is definitely the sense in which working through to integrate that memory is going to initially, even if the offset is that you, you free up energy, it's going to take even more energy psychically to mend and repair. And that is also ballasted by the fact that working through the memory and, and making it conscious provides so much unpleasure that it can reaffect the um, the repression and bring it down harder. It's similar to kind of how Freud talks about jokes as as a coping mechanism, right? That oh, the right, joke yeah. may may lift the repression, but it, it's almost a way of acknowledging it so as to so as to put it back down even right. harder to disavow, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, that's interesting. Jokes is like an egoistic defense. Huh. Yeah. I makes do sense. So. I mean, I as the person who is always doing bits, it totally makes sense. Obviously, there are various... Because it's a way of repressing the real, right? The very terrifying real is to just make a joke of it, right? Exactly. But to be fair, jokes also provide pleasure, as we know. Laughter it, unleashes the physical affect, right? The, the pressure. Yeah, laughing. Mm -hmm. And it can... Create endorphins to get back to this biological. Substrate. Laughter is the best medicine. I guess that's the thing. I mean, for Freud, if laughing were enough, that would make psychoanalysis easy. Yeah, if right. if the economic model were enough, because he, he very much sticks with the economic model from the beginning to the end. But you've also got these topographies to consider, or the topological model. You've got the dynamic model. Uh, so just considering. A symptom in terms of, well, wouldn't it be great if you integrated this so you had more free psychical energy? If it were that easy, we would have perfected psychoanalysis <laughs> millennia ago. Makes sense. I know this sounds weird and there's a lot more to talk about, but <laughs> do we really need to? It almost feels like nice and succinct to end on that note, but it's up to you. I guess one aspect, I, this is a goofy thing, but I'll bring it up nonetheless because i think it's topical and kind of interesting is and i guess i'm getting hung up on like this root of sublime or like sublimation being sublime because it's almost like there is a uh there's a sublimation of sex which sounds funny right sex itself is sublimated in the sense of it we try to desexualize sex by this argument of sex should only be tied to reproduction solely in any sexuality outside of reproduction is enough is bad is unproductive it's waste right can i read a, a quote from Freud? yeah please 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 this is civilized sexual morality and modern nervous illness which is published in 1908 so freud says 
or Laplante says Freud looks for the ultimate motive force of these types of behavior in a transformation of the sexual instinct. The sexual instinct, this quote Freud, places extraordinary large amounts of force at the disposal of civilized activity, and it does this in virtue of its especially marked characteristic of being able to displace its aim without materially diminishing its intensity. This capacity to exchange its originally sexual aim for another one, which is no longer sexual, but which is psychically related to the first aim, is called the capacity for sublimation. It's displacement, as you kind of said it earlier, which you were talking about the displacement of energies from the vital to the the sexual. And I I would want to call it that being a transferal. But I do think here displacement is good for talking about sublimation. Yeah. I mean, I was just using kind of like colloquial those words colloquial so definitely feel free to like freud takes sublimation from obviously he's thinking of the arts and the sublime and the beautiful even to go back to the uh symposium the distinction between the body and the and the ideal form yeah one particular beautiful body to all particular beautiful bodies to the form you're passing your desire for one particular beautiful body straight to the forms without an intermediary. That's sublimation. Because honestly, sublimation is also a chemical term where you go from a solid to a gas without melting. I take this physical, this crude physical process, and I elevate it to something that is beyond, that's transcendent. Plato's really good here because it is about, desire is for Diotima, Socrates, it is Love, desire is desire to bring birth in beauty, which is also described as for the immortal. So if procreation is the kind of material base level in which mammals or animals can reproduce and thereby live on immortally through the line, there's a sense in which sublimating that by reaching immortality without procreation, without physical procreation, if you will, right, through works of art etc. Intellectual yeah. activity, that could be the sublimated form of, of immortality. And, you know, it's even, even you could think of Achilles. Yeah, uh, I was going to say the Greek notion of immortality plays very well into that, right? Because it's yeah. not the body that persists, it's the, like, history or whatever. Like, you yeah, know, I mean, art, great works of art, great works of, to go to Achilles, great, you know, stories, etc. Great like, deeds, great, yeah, or, or like story. Like, to live on yeah. in the songs. I mean, this is something yeah. that they talk about in Game of Thrones as well. It's oh, right, like, right. Is this something that a song, a, this, oh, like, I feel like someone being jealous of another person, like, this is something that would get a, you know, a singer would devote a song to these acts of valor or what have you. Yeah, I mean, Achilles is told by his mother, you know, you're going to, if you go and fight Hector, you're going to die. Right. But you'll live on, exactly. you know, but, but Achilles is thinking, I'll live on in song in the Homeric ballad, or if you don't do that, you'll live a long life, have children, et cetera. Right. So it's this choice between the genitality, which we could call it that, right? Sexual reproductive acts, which is one way of, of creating or do you want, do you a want to limited take the... <laughs> domain of, of mortality? Or do he you want to... Bo- he takes the Baudrillard route, yeah. I think. Do you, do you want a, a greater immortality and live on in song and be talked about on a podcast a couple thousand years <laughs> Very nice. Uh, I do want to mention just briefly the reason I even – well, part of the reason was that Laplanche even references specifically the uh, the symposium within this text. Yeah, he does. And Freud's derivation – I mean we mentioned when we talked about Plato last Wednesday, one of the places he talks about the symposium is in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. So yeah, Laplanche has to refer to it. I think he brings Plato up in three essays, but I could be wrong. In any case, yeah. yeah I don't recall offhand. Is there anything else for sublimation so we can end on uh, that? No, I think that's that's all I had. I would probably just tease, like, there's a lot more to this book. The second half, I think, is a lot more technical and nitty-gritty with regard to sadism and masochism, but also the death drive and, and going through the death drive, but also, like, a lot of stuff that goes into zero and so forth that I think would be valuable. And, you know what I mean? Even if you're, like, trying to read Nick Land or CCRU type shit. I mean, I think this would be a good read for even those, you know, people that have those types of interests. Another thing is that I'll bring up just because I have it on the screen is this like diagram that he made with regard to the primary process, secondary process, death drive, eros, etc. Don't know about you, but I think this very much resembles the libidinal band, kind of like the, what is it? The Mobius strip. Yeah, the strip. 
Yeah, it does. Something we'll have to return to for sure because I want to discuss like the free energy, the bound energy. That's relation to primary and secondary processes, death drive, eros. That's a fascinating discussion. I think maybe the bound and the free energy would go towards my kind of discussion of the, what would it be, intensity relative to amplitude, etc. But those are just some kind of finishing thoughts to kind of tease this work for anybody that's interested in reading the majority of it. Because it is a, definitely one I would recommend, again, to people that are interested, whether it be in psychoanalysis, broadly speaking, or even to something like, yeah. Land's work, the CCRU, like this stuff on the death drive in zero, I think is very, very foundational for that. Did you have any other thoughts that you wanted to work over? I, I think everything so with? everything she said was <laughs> was good. And uh, I will end with this note from LaPlanche. In the psychoanalytic literature, the concept of sublimation is frequently called upon. The idea indeed answers the basic need of the Freudian doctrine. And it is hard to see how it could be dispensed with. The lack of a coherent theory of sublimation remains one of the lacunae in psychoanalytic thought. So skipping over the other page or two in that definition from the language of psychoanalysis, it is interesting that he's like pointing out, yeah, there isn't a fully formed, coherent theory of sublimation. And it is one of those gaps that needs to be filled in. That's why we keep talking about it. I'm stuck on this notion of reading it like the root sublime and making so much more sense, I guess. Because I think that's something that I initially kind of glossed over, but it really helps drive home what's it work conceptually, I think. But if you're pleased there, we can stop and wrap up this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor motherfucking Atkins. Peace. <laughs> the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. The whole state of things, a cure of violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. What I meant is the following. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.